let's turn to 219. 219 for our opening hymn. There's nothing like the old, old story. Grace is free. Grace is free. With saints and martyrs telling glory. Grace is free. Grace is free. 219. We'll stand together while we sing. That's a great old hymn and it's a good going hymn and the words are absolutely tremendous and we'll be thinking about that in part tonight about the grace of God in Christ. Let me welcome you tonight as we join together. Thank you for coming out. We trust the Lord will bless us here as we meet in the church hall and for those listening in on Facebook Live, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus and trust that you'll be blessed as you meet with us this evening. Now, Friday, 1215 Woody's Bible study. The study is entitled The Sevens of the Gospel of John. And then this coming Lord's Day, 10 o'clock in the morning, will be Sunday school and Bible class, 1130, the morning service and the breaking of bread. Mark Harlan, God willing, will be speaking to the children. Quarter to six, our prayer meeting. Half past six, our gospel meeting. And then at eight o'clock, the youth fellowship will recommence. And then, of course, Don Atchison and Claire McKelvey will be on Children's Church. Diane Maidley, Yvonne McCrum, and Lois Kinniff will be on Christ's duty. So that's all the announcements necessary tonight. Let's just bow together in prayer and let's ask for God's help and for his blessing. 
this evening. Our God and our Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of meeting together on another Wednesday evening here in this place. We come to you, our Father, as always in the Saviour's name. We approach your high and holy throne, not because of anything in ourselves, but simply because we're in Christ. And Father, we thank you for the grace of God that we've been singing about just now. We praise you, our Father, that your word tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And Father, we thank you for your marvelous, matchless grace. We praise you that you have not dealt with us as our sin deserved. We thank you that you've shown us great grace and great mercy. And out of a heart of love, you've reached out to us when we were dead in trespasses and in sins. And yet, our Father, in your wonderful grace, you have transformed these lives of ours. You have given us something to sing about. You have given us a hope for heaven within our souls. You have given us the wonderful blessings of salvation. And our Father, we have everything we'll ever need in time and for eternity in the person of your lovely Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your kindness and goodness today. Thank you for every provision that you have made for us. Thank you for watching over us. And thank you, Father, for being with us because we have that conscious awareness of your presence. We stand upon your wonderful promise every day. No matter what circumstances come to us, you have said that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Would you bless each one of us listening here this evening, whether in the building or those, our Father, who meet with us on Facebook Live. We thank you that you know every detail about each of us. And Father, we pray that our hearts will be warmed as we come and spend this time together around your uh, feet and around your word. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we have it in our own language and as we come to your word to think further about this great book, the book of Ephesians, Father, we need your help. Because our Father, as we come to it, we realize our own inability. We need the enabling of the Holy Spirit. We need to be able, with the Spirit's help, to open up this wonderful book and to do it justice as together we meet for Bible study and for prayer. So bless each one of us, we ask, and grant to us an understanding heart and a listening ear. And Father, may we, enabled by your Spirit, make every effort that we can to apply your word to our hearts, because we are your people. We live in a strange world, and yet we want to bear a witness to others that our faith in Jesus Christ is a reality, that what we have has been life-changing, and that others can have that too through faith in his finished work on the cross. Bless each of us then, we pray. Remember those who'd love to be with us and cannot for many different reasons. We just commend them to the grace of God and pray that you'll watch over every member, every adherent, every friend of this, our local church. We commend to you just now. And again, we ask for the forgiveness of all our sins we're in. We have failed you today, and we pray in the sea of yours worthy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Now turn with me, please, back to the book of Ephesians, and we're turning to Ephesians 2, and we're going to read together the first 10 verses. By now, these should be familiar to us because we've read these for a couple of studies and we'll hopefully get through them tonight and then move on into what is another wonderful passage of scripture. It almost seems every time you come from one section to another, it's another wonderful section that's worth considering and there are many of them yet to come in the will of God. But tonight Ephesians 2 and verse 1 through to verse 10. Paul says, and you 
How they quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. God will bless this reading from his word. Now, it's been a few weeks over Christmas and then through our week of prayer into January since we have last been together around the word of God here in Ephesians 2. And we've been thinking about what God has done for us in Christ. You'll know that here in Ephesians 2, particularly in the opening few verses, we have one of the greatest sections that we find in Scripture regarding the doctrine of salvation. And as we approach these 10 verses together, I said to you we would consider two different things, two very important things. And the first was we see their position prior to conversion. When you and I look at the lives of these people before they were reached by the grace of God, it is certainly not a pretty picture because we know first of all that they were without spiritual life. They were dead in trespasses and in sin. So they were ignorant of God. They failed to reach the mark as far as God was concerned. They were separated from God, living in the darkness of their sin, and they possessed no spiritual life whatsoever. And not only that, they disobeyed God and they were being deceived by the devil. So they were not only dead, they were disobedient, and of course they were deceived or they were deluded, and also we noted that they were under the wrath of God, so they were doomed. Now that's not a very nice picture to begin with here in Ephesians chapter 2, but the reality is, beloved, that that's where you and I used to be before we were ever saved. We were in the same state uh, these people were and it's an awful thing to even consider that you and I would have lived under the wrath of God, knowing that we were condemned already. But then we moved secondly to we see the work that God in grace did for them. And when you look at verse 4 right through to verse 10, there are some wonderful truths here contained in these verses. They were dead, deceived, and they were deluded and they were doomed. But then the Bible says, but God, and that's an arresting statement. Despite all that they were in salvation, God had something better for them, and God had something better for us. We notice that God is not only rich in grace and abounding in love and abundant in mercy. Through salvation, he provides for us something that we desperately need and something that we dare not live without. Now, as far as these believers were concerned, we noted, first of all, that God had embraced them in love. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith, he loved us. That love is one of God's attributes, but it's a very different kind of love from any other love that you and I could even think about. It's that love we often refer to in Romans chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul says there, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God 
loves the unlovable. We thought about the love of God, and this is where really we broke off last week or the last time we were together. Thinking about God's love, we sought to understand its definition. Because in verse 4 it says, God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Often in the scriptures, when you come across the love of God, you will see that uh, given to us in different ways. For example, it's an abundant love. It's a so great love. It's an eternal love or an everlasting love. And here Paul says it's a great love. Now, it's a great love because it reaches beyond the barrier that is caused by sin. And not only that, it reaches you, it reaches me in our hopeless and helpless estate. And despite what we have done, this is what Samuel Medley says in a lovely hymn. He saw me ruined by the fall, yet loved me notwithstanding all. He freed me from my lost estate, his loving kindness. Oh, how great. What love God has shown you and me as sinners in his sight. We thought about its definition. What about its depth? You see, beloved, God's love is unlike any other kind of love because God's love is an act of love. You know how sometimes you might see a brother or sister in Christ or you, you go around somewhere, you go with your wife and somebody meets you and they shake your hand and they talk about many things and then, you know, you walk away and say, oh, I just love that brother. But you know, if you say I love and there's nothing substantial at the end of it, it's simply words. Now, if I said to you tonight, God loves you. You would turn around and say to me, but pastor, how does he display that love? Well, you don't need to be told that, of course, because immediately you and I know the love that God expresses for sinners like us was expressed at the cross at Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave. It is love in action. And that even what we were so We've been through John's gospel on a Sunday night. John uses the word so to speak broadly about the love of God for he cannot find another word to simply express the boundlessness of God's great love. You think about that for a moment. In our sin and under condemnation, there was nothing we could do for ourselves. But we've been thinking all over the Christmas period how that God sent his son to be the savior of the world. And he who knew no sin came from eternity into time, grew up amongst men, went to the cross. And as the little hymn says that we sometimes sing, he carried my sin with him there. Think about what that means. He took my place. This is personal. I was the sinner in need of salvation. He is the Savior who had no sin. So he took my place, guilty though I was. He paid my penalty for God's justice had to be met. Sin's penalty had to be paid. And Jesus Christ paid that penalty, my debt, in full by the shedding of his own precious blood. And he took or he bore my punishment when I was the one who was guilty and deserved to be punished for my sin. Beloved, does that not tell you something? If you take what I've just said about me and apply it to yourself, does that not tell you something just now about the depth of God's love for you. You see, it's way beyond comprehension. The hymn writer tries to put it together when he says, from heaven he came, he loved you, he died. Such love as this never was known. Behold on the cross your king crucified to make you an heir to his throne. A young girl on one occasion <coughs> was out with her mother and her mother just 
instantaneously lifted her and she carried her in her arms and she wrapped her in her in her arms and she turned around and she said to her daughter with a kiss in the cheek, I love you. The little girl pulled herself away quickly from her mom, got back on the ground and she said to her, I know you do. I know you do. The thing is, she knew it, but she didn't appreciate it. Child of God, I say to my heart and I say to yours tonight, from the very depth of my being, don't ever take the love of your heavenly father for granted. I'll tell you why. He gave the very best he had. He gave the very darling of his bosom to die on that center cross for you and me. God had embraced them in love. Here's the second thing. God had quickened them. God had quickened them. You know, that simply means that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God had made these people alive. He had quickened them. After all, they were dead in sin. The one thing they didn't have was spiritual life. And only God could give them the life that they needed. The word that is used here for quickened, in the original, it can mean to cause to live, or it can mean to make alive or to give life. That's what they needed. They were dead, Paul says, in their sins. And I said the first time about that particular word. It's not that they were sick. They were dead. They had absolutely no spiritual life. And only God could give them what they needed. And Paul says he hath quickened us together with Christ. Listen to these words in Romans 6 for a moment, verse 3. Paul says on that occasion, know ye not? That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of of his resurrection. What's Paul saying? Simply this. Our identification with Christ in his death breaks the power of indwelling sin. And our identification with Christ in his resurrection results in the imparting of divine life. Here's how John Phillips puts it. He says, grace triumphed over guilt and the grave. For God reached down into the corruption of death and he raised us up. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. God had embraced them in love. Secondly, God had quickened them. Thirdly, God had raised them for look at how Paul puts this but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus now that's very interesting because Paul is saying to these believers look your physical location may be on earth. Your spiritual position is in heavenly places with Christ. They were not there yet physically. But Paul says to them spiritually, they were already there because of their union with Christ. It's as if they were raised to life. And then already seated where he is. Now, beloved, that's amazing. Because God had not only quickened them, he had raised them to sit in heavenly places with Christ. They were not only united to him, they were exalted with him. You see, that's the lovely thing about God's dealing in salvation. 
When God saves a man, he doesn't raise him up to leave him in the graveyard. He raises him up and he sets him in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. The fact that Christ has been raised himself and exalted to the Father's right hand, that's not only foreshadowed, but it's guaranteed to every believer in Christ. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Simply this. The believer who is now united to Christ will one day be with Christ and will one day share in his eternal glory. That's what you have ahead of you. Sometimes we live as if we're defeated Christians in a world with all our woes. Friend, listen, this is our locality. We live in the world. We don't belong to the world. One day we're going home. That's why in writing to the believers at Colossae, Paul says this in Colossians 3.1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. If you and I are believers in Jesus Christ tonight, we're heavenly people. And we're not only heavenly people, according to Paul, in Christ we're already seated in the heavenlies. This world is not our home. I'm sure there are times when some believers make it their home. And because of family, friends, and so many other things, they don't want to leave it. But child of God, this world is not our home. Remember what the Apostle Paul said to the believers in Philippi, Philippians 3, 20, 21. For our conversation, the word means citizenship. For our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We're no longer off this world because we've been made alive. Our lives have been transformed. We've already been reminded that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, heavenly places in Christ. And one day we are going home to be with him. God had embraced them in love. God had quickened them. God had raised them. And here's the fourth thing Paul says, God would keep them. God would keep them. I, I wish I had a pound for every time in the course of conversation with workmates before I went into ministry and others that I meet and my family and wider circle of friends. When you talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation and they turn around and they say, oh, I couldn't keep that. I, I couldn't keep that. Do you know the good thing about salvation? I couldn't keep it either, but he keeps me and he keeps you. And Paul says here, look, Listen to these words. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What is the real purpose in this salvation? Why would God save us ever and bring us into such a wonderful and blessed position? Listen to what Paul says. Verse 7. He says that in the ages to come, not now. Remember how we thought about their past? You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Then their present state had been brought from darkness into light made to sit in heavenly places in Jesus Christ, and then he goes to the future. 
Because everything about salvation is about the past that's dealt with under the blood, about the present, how that you and I live in the power of the Spirit for the glory of God. And then the future, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Paul says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Beloved, the God who has been gracious to us and we've been singing tonight, grace is free. Grace is free. The God who has been gracious to us, who has saved us, blessed us, sealed us, he wants to keep on blessing us. And he wants to continue to pour his grace into these lives of ours. For by grace are you saved. We'll think about that in a moment or two. But you know, whenever God saves us by his grace, it's not the end of grace. It's not the end of grace. Because Paul says in the ages to come that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Do you know what that tells me? That God wants to keep blessing us in the future. And he wants to keep on pouring his grace into these lives of ours. Isn't that amazing? I love the words that John MacArthur uses when he says this. I'm sure those of you who maybe listened to him know that he went into hospital last week, but that's a different story. Here's what he says. He says, from the moment you were saved and for the rest of the ages throughout eternity, God is unloading on you the riches of his grace. What a statement that is. It's great to turn around and say, Lord, thank you for your grace that has lifted me. But then there's the grace that keeps me. And then there's the grace that awaits me. Is it any wonder? It's better on ahead. You think about salvation for a moment. And what it meant to these believers at Ephesus. Because God's purpose in saving them was not just to do with time. It had to do with eternity. And God's purpose in saving them was not just to rescue them from hell. It was to prepare them for heaven. And God's purpose is an eternal purpose because having saved them, having sealed them, he would keep them until that day when they would be presented faultless in his presence. Do you know whenever sometimes people testify and they talk about their faith and they talk about Jesus and they talk about salvation and then they say, I was rescued from hell. It's only half the story. It's only half the story, beloved. God has rescued us from hell. But God works with us in the light of eternity. God's purpose in saving us is also to prepare us for heaven. God's grace has saved us. God's grace sustains us. And as that great hymn by Newton says, God's grace will one day bring us safely home. But we cannot leave it there. God had embraced them in love. God had quickened them. God had raised them. God would keep them. And here's the fifth thing Paul says. God had a purpose for them. God had a purpose for them. Look at verse 8 for a moment. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I would suggest tonight for many Christians that 
These two verses here, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, are as familiar to them as is John 3, 16. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself. One of the great statements that we have in the New Testament regarding salvation is this one. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves. And you see, that was necessary in Paul's day and that is necessary for our day too for the simple reason that multitudes of people are trying to work their way to heaven. Paul says, no, for by grace are you saved through faith. You see, beloved, false religions, and it doesn't matter which one you pluck out tonight, false religions has at their very heart the principle that salvation must be earned. I must give. I must be better. I must work as hard as I can. I must do, do, do. Done. That's what God says. Done. And Paul says it's all of grace. For by grace are you saved. Through faith. It's not of yourself. Sometimes we dwell in verse 8 and 9 to the exclusion of verse 10, which is every bit as important. But just think of a moment for verse 8 and 9. For by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll know by now that word grace is one of the most important Bible words you'll ever come across. God's love freely shown towards sinners is one of many ways of translating this. Here's the thing. Whenever you and I come to read the New Testament message, I'm talking about jumping from the old economy into the new, leaving the Old Testament behind and stepping into the Gospels, you will discover that it's crystal clear that the grace of God has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Remember what the Apostle John said, John 1, 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, if you look back at the Old Testament scriptures, there is absolutely no doubt that it is dominated by the reality of God's law. But when you come to the New Testament, it's that of grace. It's that of grace. Now, I understand, and you do as well, that Paul himself was steeped in a religion that made him do. That was his religion. And of course then Paul himself was saved by grace. And when he was saved by grace and he was sent out as a servant of God to hear there and yonder to every ardent part where the Spirit of God led him, what did Paul do? He preached the gospel of God's grace. No matter where he went, there were Judaizers, those who maintained that Paul was wrong that even though the gospel may have been right in a sense, there was something that was desperately needed and Paul wasn't telling the people and Peter wasn't telling the people and Philip didn't tell the people, but they did. And what did they do? They turned around and they said, listen, you can become a Christian, but you must adhere to the law of Moses as well. And there's an emphasis in their works. Paul says no. And from Paul right down through the reformers right through to this present day, beloved, it is as simple as this. Salvation comes in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone. 
no extras. And we need to be careful sometimes when we talk to people about getting saved. We can be a little bit like the Judaizers. Oh, yes, you can come to Christ, but you must do, 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 do. And what we do is we turn the grace of God into a life of legalism, sometimes asking people to do what the Bible doesn't ask them to do. Let God teach them. Let God make them and mold them. Just tell them about the grace of God when they're saved. God doesn't need my help to mold those people. For by grace... Grace alone are you saved through faith, through faith alone. And Paul makes that clear. And Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, makes that clear. Salvation is not something that can be earned. We don't deserve it. It can't be attained by any kind of human activity because it's all of grace. Now you say to me, hold on, Pastor. You suggesting then when a man or woman gets saved, they can do what they like. There, there are no things that they have to heed to. No, that's not what I said. I said salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But then listen to what Paul says here. He turns around and he says, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. As Charles Spurgeon says it like this, because God is gracious, therefore sinful men are forgiven, converted, purified, and saved. It is not because of anything in them or that can ever be in them that they are saved but because of the boundless love, goodness, pity, compassion, mercy, and grace of God. That's why sometimes we sing in our gospel meetings, wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, then lets me go free. Wonderful grace that gives me the time to change and washes away the stains that once covered me. So there's a work done in salvation by grace alone. But beloved, you will see here that the Apostle Paul stresses, though salvation is all of grace, don't forget it's on to good works. It's on to good works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now, Paul's not contradicting what he has already said about grace. Salvation is of the Lord. But what Paul is saying is this, if we are genuinely saved, then that salvation will be evidenced in good works. There'll be a change. There'll be the reality of a conversion that lets people know something has happened. Because our lives should show forth to his glory. And showing forth good works are part of God's purpose for us. Verse 9, you will note the word works is negative. You can't have salvation by works. You look at verse 10, you'll see the use of the word works is positive. Because if we are genuinely saved, our faith will work. Our faith will work. Isn't that James's whole argument in that lovely little epistle that we've also been through in the past? Good works tonight will show forth the reality of our faith, the growth of our Christian lives, our character and our conduct will be the evidence or the result of our salvation. Do you know that word, workmanship, in the original is a very important one. Do you know what it means? Masterpiece. Masterpiece. We haven't only been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God has designed it 
from eternity past. That when he brings us to faith in Jesus Christ by his grace, that God will shape us and mold us into the image of his son. Good works are part of that. We are his workmanship. We don't only work for him, he works in us. John Philip says if we profess to be Christians, but our lives exhibit no evidence of behavioral change, we are self-deceived. That sums it up. Whenever somebody says, well, you know, I was saved in 1944. They're standing outside a bar when you talk to them and they say, I was saved in 1944. They're standing with a pint in their hand and they're saying, cheers, something wrong, something wrong. And there's a list of other things we could go through tonight, even down to our behavior before each other. If it's not right before God, there's something wrong. Because at the end of the day, it is God who is shaping us, molding us, conforming us to the image of his son for his design and desire for us that we might be his masterpiece. Beloved, these are searching words in Ephesians 2, what God has done for, for us in Christ. You see their position prior to conversion, but you see the work that God and grace did in them. And all we can say tonight is this. Grace changes everything. Grace changes everything. And always thank God for his marvelous, matchless grace. Let's pray together just for a moment. Father, we bow to thank you for your grace. We thank you for your salvation that we have embraced through faith in Christ alone. But Father, our earnest prayer is that we will now go on onto good works. But Father, that as you continue to mold and make us into the people that we need to be, that every single day there will be a greater conformity to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we know when we sing it little by little, he's changing me. And we long that that change will continue until the beauty of Jesus is seen in us. So would you help us to rejoice in salvation, but at the same time strive for a likeness to the Lord Jesus, that others might look at us and know We've been with him and we're going home to him and that changes everything about our faith and about our behavior. Would you help us be what we ought to be in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen.